torques cause angular accelerations. Forces cause linear accelerations. And torques cause angular accelerations. The big difference, of course, being that the torque depends on where the force is applied and the relationship between the axis of rotation and also the orientation of that force. So the torque, lowercase tau, is equal to the distance from the axis of rotation pointing towards the force times the force that's applied times the sine of the angle between them, which we're calling psi. Okay. So, a given torque can be increased by either increasing the force or increasing the distance from the axis of rotation or making the relationship between the R and the F be the maximum relationship for this quantity, which would be 90 degrees. So if you have this situation where you have a distance from, say, my arm, let's use my arm as the lever here, the pivot right here is at my elbow, if I apply a force perpendicularly to my arm, either up or down, that's going to have the maximum torque as opposed to if I'm applying a force here or if I'm applying a force back this way. There, the 90 degree relationship will have the maximum effect. And a torque applied, a force applied out here will have less, will have more of a torque, pardon me, than the torque that's applied in here because the R here is larger and the R here is shorter. Okay. So, if we are indeed going to create an, an angular acceleration, let's look at what that means with regard to a force and Newton's second law for a simple case, where by a simple case, I mean, let's take the idea of something on a table, a horizontal table, so imagine this being horizontal, so like this, okay, where you have a ball that's attached to a rod at the center and it's moving around in a circle. So it is tracing out a circle as it's moving around as a distance r from the center of that rotation, and it has a mass m. Okay. So the question is, what is this behavior with regard to the angular motion? If you look at Newton's second law, we can start with the fact that f is equal to ma, okay? because that is a true statement for what's going on here. But we want to look at, instead of the linear motion, we want to look at the angular motion, we want to look at the torques involved, so that we can figure out what's happening and what is making this object move in a circle, what is giving the angular acceleration that it has, or anything all like that. Okay. So if we look at this and we say, oh, okay, let me look at the torque here instead of looking at the force. So I want to multiply my force on this side by the R. So we have F times R is equal to M times R times A. I'm going to put that there and keep the A separate over there. Okay. So this is now the torque. And this is M times R times A, but we don't want the actual linear acceleration now, because we're talking about angular stuff, we want to remember what A is in terms of the um, angular quantities. And this A, looking at this circle, is, has to be the A that's directed here, because we're looking at some force that's going to be applied perpendicular to the axis of rotation that is making it actually move around in a circle like that. So, um, looking at that tangentially, not looking at the centripetal acceleration part that we've already discussed. So, if we look at the tangential acceleration there, that means we technically should have a t subscript on the a. And remember that a sub t is equal to r times alpha. Just like v sub t is equal to r times omega, and s, arc length, is equal to r times theta, the angular displacement, the linear acceleration in the tangential aspect here is equal to the radius times the angular acceleration. So that means that then the torque is equal to m 
times r times r alpha or m r squared alpha. Okay. So you have to look at this and look at what this means. Now we again have some thing that is creating a behavior and some effect. So the force here is causing a linear acceleration. The torque here is causing an angular acceleration. So first of all, what I have to do is generalize this right here, this mr squared, to be potentially more particles that are moving around in the circle. So we could have a disk rotating, or we could have a hoop of stuff rotating, we'd have a cone rotating, we'd have a cylinder rotating, and each one of those parts will have a different collection of particles together that will end up giving you a quantity that is represented by something like mr squared. But they're not all going to be mr squared. And so we have to replace this with torque is equal to, well, the sum of our torques, okay, is going to be equal to I times the angular acceleration, where I is the moment of inertia, where, and that's equal to all the different parts that could contribute to the mr squares, just like we had there with that ball, or that part moving around on the tabletop. So we represent that by this summation of adding up all the different parts of mass in your object times the distance from the axis of rotation squared. So I'll get into more details of that in a second. But let's first of all think about the concepts involved here. We have the sum of our torques equals moment of inertia times our angular acceleration, which is directly analogous to the sum of our forces is equal to a mass times the linear acceleration. So this force is acting on some object with mass m and it's resulting in this acceleration. What is the mass? Well, it's the inherent stuff the object is made of, yes, but it's also the quantity that resists the motion. Okay? As I alluded to in class, if you're trying to push a 100 gram crate across the floor, or trying to push a 100,000 gram crate across the floor, the 100,000 gram crate across, that you're trying to push across the floor is going to resist your forces a lot more. It's going to resist moving a lot more than what um, the 100 gram crate would, would be resisting. And so that mass right there is a measurement of the resistance of an object to change in motion, to change in linear motion. So now, what do we have over here? We have our torque acting on an object. We have the resulting angular acceleration of the object, and we have the moment of inertia. And that moment of inertia is directly analogous to m conceptually and mathematically. It's a proportionality constant, mathematically, between the, the torque and the angular acceleration. And then it is the resistance to change in rotational motion. So like this is the ro resistance and change to linear motion. This is the resistance and change to rotational motion. And so that will depend on the shape of your object. It depends on geometry. Because it involves both the amount of stuff here and then also the distance of, uh, or the size of the object, meaning the distance of certain points to the axis of rotation. So it depends on both the amount of stuff that makes up your object, and then also the distribution of that stuff in the object. So a disk is going to have a different moment of inertia than a sphere, and it's going to have a different moment of inertia than a rod. It's going to have a different moment of inertia than one single particle. Okay, one single particle would, as we showed, as I showed before, is just m r squared, small m for that being the particle. So, different things are going to have different objects. Like I said, are going to have different moments of inertia, and we're investigating that in class now with the idea that we can't neglects pulleys anymore, because pulleys are cylinders that have rotational motion associated with them. And so we're going to have to actually be analyzing the torques as applied to pulleys and looking at the moments of inertia of those things. And also, we could look at the same thing for a ball rolling down a hill. 
Okay, looking at the rotational motion of that spherical object as it moves down. So we have to be thinking about these uh, slightly more complex arguments and not the more idealized cases as before. So let's think about an example with regard to this. Let's think about some system of particles. Let's say it's a baton that someone's going to be twirling. And let's say that each of these masses are 2.0 kilograms, and these masses are 1.0 kilograms. And we want to find the moment of inertia of this collection of particles, imagine the end of the batons being the, the particles, about this center of rotation. So I'm going to be spinning it counterclockwise or clockwise, and it doesn't matter which way you spin it with regard to the actual moment of inertia. It just depends on the mass involved, and it depends on the distribution of the particles that make up your object, and distribution meaning distance from the center of rotation. So let's say that each one of these is about, for simplicity's sake, let's say they're a meter. That would be a very huge baton, but let's say they're all a meter. Okay. So that means that for the sum of i equals 1 to n, of m i r i squared, so, again, this sum notation basically says, look at each one and add them all up. So let's call this one 1, this one 2, this one 3, and this one 4. So really what this is saying is that our capital N is 4, and so we have m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared plus m3 r3 squared plus m4 r4 squared. Okay, so we need to then add all of this up and get what our actual answer is. So in this situation, all the r's are going to be one meter, based on how I've drawn this. And m1 is one kilogram, m2 is two, m3 is one, and m4 is two. So this ends up being uh, 1.0 kilograms times 1.0 meters squared plus 2.0 kilograms times 1.0 meters squared plus 1.0 kilograms times 1.0 meters squared plus 2.0 kilograms times 1.0 meters squared. And if you add all this up, you get 1 times 1 squared etc, etc. So you end up with 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 2 is 6, and it was 6.0 kilogram meters squared through moment of inertia. Okay. Now, if I were asking you, instead of to twirl this baton this way, to twirl it this way, so that it 1 is coming out of the board and 3 is going into the board, so we are spinning along the axis of rotation of 2 and 4, so it's doing this. Then what's the moment of inertia? Okay. So in that situation, we still of course have m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared plus m3 r3 squared plus m4 r4 squared. But the distances to our center of rotation are now slightly different. So the center of rotation is now on the axis of 2 and 4. So their distance, r2 and r4, are actually zero, because they're actually on the axis of rotation. So this is only, it's m1 r1 squared plus zero, plus m3 r3 squared plus zero, or plugging in the numbers, that means that you end up with 2.0 kilogram meters squared, since you have one, one kilogram times one meter squared, plus one kilogram times one meter squared. So it's definitely a very different moment of inertia depending on the actual rotation of the object. And that's why you have to worry about the different shapes. And we'll be talking about that and talking about more of actual net torques that give you angular accelerations next class. But the fundamental idea is that just like Newton's second law, the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration, the sum of our torques is equal to our moment of inertia times our angular acceleration.